Today I am joined by Australian striker John Idale, who plays for German three-legger club Wien Wiesbaden. Thank you so much for joining me today, John. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. You mentioned the other day that you watched a video of mine, so you might not be surprised that my first question, it's my typical first question I like to ask people to break the ice, just where did your love and passion for football first begin? From the moment I was born, really. Um, it's in the family. Um, my dad used to play. He only stopped a few years ago. Um, was always at his games. And my grandparents are hugely involved in uh, spirit in uh, New South Wales, NPL. Well, they used to be. Um, yeah, so I started playing when I was four. You know, just that was the sport. You know, I also played a little bit of baseball and athletics back then. But it was just always football that was on my mind, you know. I was always wanting to go out and play football and grab a ball. So the other sports kind of disappeared pretty quickly and it was just all football from there. And when you were a kid, um, when was that moment when you thought to yourself that football was what you wanted to do as a profession? Did you always know that you wanted to be a footballer or was it maybe that you were playing, you know, you're 11 or 12, you realised that you were pretty good and people said to you, hey, you should become a professional? Yeah, good question. Um, I was always scoring goals. Um, I was always a striker and I always had a lot of fun doing it. Um, so my dad was my coach for maybe one or two years when I was um, eight or nine or so. Um, and I was just doing it for fun. Always loved to go there with my friends and everything. Um, and then I went to uh, Gladesville Hornsby Football Association in the in the old SAP, like 11s and 12s. Um, and I was, I was doing well, I was scoring goals there, you know. Um, but it wasn't until I actually went through the school system for like um, trying for like, you know, you go from your school and your area, and then ultimately you try out for your state team through the school system. And I just did it because you know, I was the best player in my school at the time, you know. Um, it was, yeah, primary school, right? Uh, I was 12 years old. Um, and I'm, I remember going to this tournament and then it was to make the New South Wales team. And it was just there, just playing, having fun. And we we're all sitting in this grandstand after and they're announcing the team one by one, you know. And they always started at your area. So like the team that you're at now. And then they went back to then the, the regional area before that. And then they went to your school. And I was just sitting there and I heard my school come up. And I was like, wait, I'm the only one from my school here, you know. And I made this New South Wales team. And then I was actually asked to be joint um, joint captain at that tournament. Um, then we went, went ahead and won the whole tournament against all the other states. And it was from that moment, I was like, hey, this is something that I could, you know, make as a career, you know, maybe I'm actually good. You know, I never really thought about it before that, but, you know, just having that experience as a kid was like, wow, you know, I really love that. I want to do more of that. Yeah. And obviously professional athletes have to make a lot of sacrifices, whether or not it's, you know, missing out on eating KFC or burgers or socially not being able to hang out with your friends because you're training, all that sort of thing, missing school because you've got training, games, etc. So for you being, you know, a young teenager chasing this professional dream, what were some of the first big real sacrifices that you had to make? And how do you think that made you a better person and player? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, it's not easy, especially when you're younger, to understand those type of sacrifices. Now, when, when I'm living as a professional footballer every day, it's just normal, right? But when you're a kid, it's, it's not normal, and then it has to suddenly be normal very quickly, kind of, you know? Um, I just remember I was sitting down with my, my best friend's dad, who is uh, actually my agent now, and he gave me a little insight, like um, what professional footballers do, right? And I think it was kind of from that moment, I was like, okay, not so many lollies, not so much uh, KFC and, and McDonald's, you know, like it was just the easy choices, you know, when you come home from, from training or something, right? And it was from that moment where I was like, okay, I need to, to focus and, you know, it, I was always asked by friends like, hey, why you not do this? Why you not do that? I'm like, 
it's just not my priority. Um, it was quite easy for me to 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 say no, I won't go to this party or something. Um, a little bit of an introvert when it comes to those things. I I like other things. Um, yeah, so it was. It came quite quickly for me at that early age, but it's definitely not easy to sustain. That's for sure. And when you finally got rewarded for all those sacrifices, your first professional contract with Sydney FC, obviously I don't have to tell you, they're a big club in the A-League. They're a big club in New South Wales, professional standard, moving on to that sort of thing. What was it like stepping up from going to, you know, semi-pro football, um, chasing this dream professionally and then finally getting there, the professional training, professional standards and all that sort of thing? Yeah, huge club. Um, they were winning the league, like and the grand final, like three years in a row, I think, when I was there. Um, yeah, it, I went to firstly to their NPL side when Sydney FC and Wanderers first joined the NPL in New South Wales. Um, and straight away, it was like, okay, everybody here is really serious, right? And it was a great environment to be around because you're suddenly not one of the best. And that's very important because you have a goal to aim for. If you're one of the best in a team, it's hard to improve your quality more than it is for someone who's in the middle to improve their quality. So for me, it was a great environment to be around. Great coaches. Um, Rob Stanton, who's now the assistant coach at Sydney FC. Awesome coach. Um he really, he really got me and the team like working together really well. And that was like a great experience to be in. Um, yeah. And so I became part of the first team a little bit um, when I was 17, but it was very hard to break in when you had uh, Bobo, Brosk, Matt Simon there, Ninkovic, everybody, and they're all, and, they, and they're winning, you know? So for me, it was, I was a little bit like of a mannequin in the training drills for them, you know? make up the numbers in, in the 11 v 11, but even that experience is, you know, priceless at that age. And speaking of the first team, I think the first time I ever saw you in the first team and heard your name was one of these pre-season glamour friendlies. It's when Arsenal come to town, full crowd, big team from Europe. I know it's just a friendly match, but like, if we're honest, it's Arsenal. It's still a big occasion. You actually played in that match. You got quite a fair few minutes actually. So what was it like when you first found out you were going to be part of that squad? And then when your number was called up, when you were told, you know, you're coming on the pitch to play against some of these Premier League stars, what was that moment like for you when you're about to step onto the field? Right, a double substitution being made by Graham Arnold, the first of them being John Iredale, and he's going to replace the aforementioned Carney. 33 years of age now, Carney. And the other change sees... I can tell you that that was not a friendly game for any of us, <laughs> especially not for me. Um, of course it is for Arsenal, um, but that's, for most of us, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to step out there, and especially in front of 80,000 fans, you know? Like, just that in whole environment is just priceless. Um, yeah, I'll take, take it back to um, uh, the moment where I was finding out if I'm in the squad or not. It's a it's an interesting story, actually. Um, so I had already had some interest from Europe before this game. Um, and it was always my goal to move to Europe. Um, but obviously, I was at Sydney FC and I, I loved it there. And the move to Europe was, was definitely not near finalized yet. So my full focus was on, on Sydney FC, right? Um, but it was uh, was after my 18th birthday. And um, I started, as I said before, like training a little bit with the first team, making up some numbers. Um, but I was in really good form, especially with the MPL. I was uh, scoring a lot there. And um, yeah, I remember I had organized a little like goodbye if it was to happen because if I was to move to Europe it would happen very quickly um so I organized this uh, paintball on a Saturday uh for all my closest friends and their parents right and so I had organized it for like three weeks in advance it was really hard to get these people together and um 
I remember I trained, trained Saturday morning and um, with the NPL squad, we trained early in the morning. And suddenly after the training, one of the, one of the trainers came across to me and a couple, couple of the boys and said, hey, you know, the first team needs some numbers. Can you stay behind? Um, they were playing Arsenal the next Wednesday. And I'm like, there's no way I'm saying no, you know. I have to be, you know. And I was like, oh, shit, I have a paintball later today. But I, I called up, I called up my family. I was like, I can't, I can't be there, you know. I have, <laughs> I have to train with the first team. Um, so I stayed there. And then basically at the end of that training, Graham Arnold got everybody together and said, like, you know, great training, everything. And I just want to make it clear that everybody here today is going to be part of the squad next Wednesday. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Are you serious? Like, that's just, like that's incredible, you know? Um, anyways, my family and friends had an amazing time. <laughs> so, so plenty of photos, that's for sure. But it, what, it meant so much more to me to have them at the Arsenal game instead of me spending time with them at this one occasion, you know? It's a memory for a lifetime, really. Um, I remember that we were heading to the game and, and um, in the bus, we were a little bit late on our schedule. We couldn't get like to the stadium. There was so much traffic. I don't think we had really thought about that prior. It's not like an A-League game where you could just turn up, right? Um, and so I remember we had to call the stadium like, yeah, we're going to be a little bit late. Um, you know, we got to push the warm-up up back a little bit. Um, all these things, but it just, just like your heart rate is up, you're just so excited. Um, and I remember looking for my my family. The first moments when I came out there on the on the pitch before the game, just taking it all in. You know, this is not something you just let slip by really quickly, right? Um, yeah, and then, and the moment I think it was what sixty fifth or seventieth minute, I get called over. And I'm like, and they're like, all right, it's your turn to go on there, you know? And I'm like, all right, let's do this. I was wearing number two. I, I think I was Ryan Grant's number. He was injured. So I've gone on like a right wing wearing number two against Arsenal. But who cares, really? <laughs> it was a great experience, really. And I nearly scored at the end there. But um, I think yes, it's Io Martinez, the goalkeeper for Argentina. He was in goals, you know, it's not very easy to beat him. Now you see he win the World Cup. So, yeah, just memories like that just stay with you forever, really. Bobo back towards McElhatton on the run here. Maybe a last chance of a consolation for Sydney in the closing seconds. Well, it's been handed to them inside the area here. Martinez with a good... Outstretched, strong right hand. Really sharp there, Martinez, wasn't it? And he, and and he, he was a strong right substitute hand. Substitute Iredale. Really loose pass from El Nenny there. Just pokes it across the goal. Martinez on it in a flash, though. Really good save. I think you've got to say that the, the probably four chances that Sydney have had have all had the ability to score as well. Oh, as like a football player or even media, you're not meant to get starstruck by some of these players. But if we're honest, when you see some of these world superstars and you're right up close to them, it can be a bit of a surreal moment. I remember when Barcelona come to Australia last year, I thought I was real cool during the whole match. But at the presser, when Xavi Hernandez come towards me and I, I got to talk to him, I had to say to myself, you know, shit, this is Xavi and just calm myself down and then ask him the question so did you have a moment like that when you're on the pitch and you're like oh my god this is you know a world-class player if so who was the player that made you a bit starstruck uh well I'm a, I'm a big Manchester United fan right so I think it would be different if we we're playing Man United um, um I don't think I really became starstruck um you know like you could say that you're scared of a defender or something but I had just known Murtasaka from from FIFA, and I knew he was slow on FIFA, and I'm fast. So, why why should I be scared? You know, I can try and outpace him. Why not? There was one moment that I remember when uh, Mesut Ozil got the ball. Um, <laughs> I just, for the love of my life, wanted him to play the ball backwards. Um, I just made sure he's not going to next me here. He's not going to dribble me, make me look stupid. So. I just did everything to make him pass the ball backwards. 
And then that was it. He didn't come like near me again because our positions are different. But at this one moment, he was in front of me. Um, but yeah, just just uh, enjoying the game. You know, you can't even you can't even hear your own teammates in this type of atmosphere, right? So it was football, um, and it's what I played my whole life. So it was not like I was hyper focused on something uh, in particular. And you did mention, you know, the going away party because you had interest from Europe, et cetera. You did actually move to Europe not long after this to um, Holland. So how did that move come about? Yeah, there was um, one or two years in the making. Um, so as an Australian, when you don't have a European passport, you can only move to Europe when you're 18. Um, so I first went over after an MPL season. I went over for two weeks to the Netherlands. And I initially had um, the plan to go to a few different clubs. Um, so I chose Netherlands because my my agent is uh, Dutch. And um, we agreed that the Netherlands could be a really good starting point for me at that age. Um, but I, I started um, these two weeks at SC Herenveen. And um, I actually, I just loved it there. And it was a really great environment. So I spent the whole two weeks there. It's kind of like putting all your eggs in one basket type of thing, but it just felt right, you know. Um, at the end of it, they said that, you know, they really they really loved me and they will keep a close eye on me because I couldn't sign me until I was 18 anyway. I was, I think I was maybe just before I turned 17, I was over there. And so they kept a close eye on me and um, kept watching me through the NPL season um, the following year. And then I was uh, up a few times with Sydney FC, the first team. And um, yeah, it was it was a moment where they said, we want you, but um, we kind of have to wait until we sell one player first, you know? Um, I was gonna join their, their under 19s team, but it was a player from their first team that they were waiting to, to move on. Um, so it was kind of like, okay, they want me, but I just have to wait. And then um, August was getting closer and closer to the end. And we were like, okay, we're still waiting. And then this is a quite an interesting story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you here about last minute deadline days, this is for sure. Um, it was like the second last day of August, I jump on a plane because they had just told me a few days before that right? It's, it's go time. Um, so I'm heading over on the second last day of August with my mom to the Netherlands. Um, it's like a 24 hour flight, I think, with a break from, from Sydney to, to the Netherlands. Um, we arrive in the morning of the last day of the transfer with the, in August. And um, it was great to see all these people again. I hadn't seen them for a year and a half or so since I came over. And um, obviously very tired, um, very jet lagged. And uh, we um, we go to lunch with them at the, this restaurant that's below the, below the stadium, right? So it was just, it was just us. Um, it was great to have a chat with them. It was kind of like uh, killing time while all the contract stuff were finishing, you know? Um, then the, the technical director of the club, he said, next time you see me, I'll be coming back here for you to sign the contracts. Um, so we're waiting, it was like one hour, two hours. My mom and I like <laughs> trying to stay awake, you know, like, cause we're so excited, but we're so jet lagged. Um, then we see him see him walking over. Um, we got all stood up like, all right, this is go time, you know? Yeah, so he, he comes walking over and he tells us that he has a problem. Yeah, what, what's the problem? Um, initially, Heron Vane were signing me on a rule um, where they could sign me as a European player for the first year of my contract. And this was going to help um, financially everybody. Um, it was making things a lot easier to make the move. But the uh, Dutch Federation had cancelled that rule halfway through this transfer window, but hadn't announced it or anything. So when we went to uh, put the paperwork through, they said, no, we, we can't accept it. 
And so it was like completely out of nowhere. Nobody knew that this rule had been changed just like a few days ago, really, like before the end of the transfer window. So then we had to wait for like one of the the big bosses from the, the Federation to finish his meeting that he was in so that he could have a look at the, the paperwork to, to accept it. Um, it was maybe another two, three hours later. It was becoming, it was like, 5 p.m. or something now when they finally came back to us and said right they've accepted it they've they've put you through you're the last player that will ever be accepted on that rule and it was like hallelujah you know finally but the funny thing was when he came back down i was passed out asleep on the floor in the restaurant <laughs> it was was hard it was a long long day um but i wasn't asleep anymore when he when he came back you know so um, I I had initially thought, you know, went upstairs, signed, took photos, everything. I thought it was all done. I was going going to the hotel, going to bed. But um, I had no idea that my agent back in Australia um told me the next day that it was really to the last twenty minutes that it all went through. So um, Australia was is like eight hours ahead of Europe. So everybody in Australia was sleeping at this time. But um, someone from the FA in Australia had to confirm it on their end that it would, you know, so it, it both ends um, line up before, I think it before it was like before 8 a.m. that next day in Australia. And my agent was up all night already so that he could communicate the whole time. But no one from the FA was awake at 2, 3 a.m. You know, they're all sleeping. <laughs> So he's he's calling everybody he knows and and apparently about 7:15 one of them wakes up and gets back to him and all the paperwork were finalized about 7:40 or something like 20 minutes before and I had no idea I just woke up the next day and he told me what happened I was like oh my god thank god thank god he was awake and, and doing that for me so it was a crazy experience um but it was the start of a huge chapter in Europe. So I was really excited that it went through. Yeah, after such a crazy start to your career in Europe and Holland in particular, I mean, it wasn't long till you started banging in the goals and you started even get, getting attention from the national team. You got called up to a camp where it was essentially Graham Arnold having a look at a lot of players who'd maybe been in the Socceroos once or twice or maybe had just been on the fringes or never even heard of. So... For you, when you get called into that camp, getting told the Socceroos are going to have a look at you, it's going to be a training camp in Turkey, what was that like? What were you doing when that call came in and how do you think you went during that camp overall? Yeah, it was, um, first of all, an amazing experience to be there. Um, so I had initially joined at Heronvane in the 19s. I had a really good season there. Um, was, as you said, scoring a lot. And I was rewarded with... Um, uh, joining the first team for preseason the next uh, for the next season, so I was uh, preseason with the uh, Herenvane, the Eredivisie squad, um, and that was that was already a learning curve. You know, it was a lot faster, a lot tougher, um, but it was great for me because I I also did well there. Um, um, that uh, Graham Arnold uh, reached out and and told me that he wanted to to bring me into the squad. But it was initially like a, a reach out to see how I'm going, you know. It was not like you're in the squad. Um, that came to the moment where I woke up one morning with uh, lots of messages to my phone. <laughs> so I knew the squad was being announced, but it was being announced during the middle of my night. And yeah, I don't think my heart has ever raced so hard when I when I woke up at that moment, like seeing seeing all those messages, you know, it was just like a already a dream come true to be even considered to go to the Socceroos, you know, and at, at 18 as well, um, I was ecstatic that it, I had the opportunity to go there. Um, first of all, you walk into the camp and, and uh, in Turkey and you see all these players who've been watching for years on TV. Um, I played with a few of them at Sydney FC. So, um, and a couple of the younger boys as well, I've played with in the younger national teams so you had some sort of familiarity but a lot that was like okay 
do I do I really belong here? You know, um, really unfortunately for me, we didn't have a, a game that training camp. Um, I'm not sure the reason behind that. Normally, every training camp there's at least one game, so there was no opportunity to make my debut in that camp, unfortunately. But it was still incredible experience to be there, and um, um, I remember I had to to sing my initiation song as well there in Turkey. Um, <laughs> And uh, I stood up there. I was quite calm the whole time until I stood up on the chair <laughs> and everyone's looking at me. Um, I sang um, uh, Down Under. You know, I went with the very traditional Australian song, that one. Um, and I remember it was, I'm not a very good singer, right? But I just, I, I gave it a go. Everything was quiet. And I would just hear Graham Arnold yell out from the other side of the, the whole um restaurant he said john that song was a classic and you ruined it for everyone <laughs> this is a comment i will never forget uh but it, yeah, it's, it just adds to the experience you know um yeah but on the pitch on the pitch was um very fast very fast um i was lucky i was just with the with the first team uh, in the netherlands because if i was coming from a second team or something to that there's no way you can keep up, right? It's just everything's so fast. Everyone's really strong and, and everyone wants to be there. So everyone was fighting and it was really awesome experience. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been back there since. Um, I think we'll we'll touch on it a little bit with some injuries, but um, it's been a little choppy stop start for me since, since that camp, really. Yeah. And behind you in the background, we see an iconic jersey, Wolfsburg, massive club in the Bundesliga, massive club that, you know, most people around the world know to have had some pretty big players over the years. Kevin De Bruyne comes to my mind straight away. When you first joined them, when you first got the offer, where did that come from and how hard was it to leave Holland of a decision? Did you know straight away, yes, I want to go to Germany or were you a bit, you know, anxious about it? Did you have a bit of second thoughts, you know, knowing that? You're just on the edge of this first team squad in Holland and you got this opportunity from Germany. Yeah, so after the, the camp with the Socceroos, I went with the, um, I think it was the under 20s. Uh, we went with, to the Asian Championships, right? Um, and I came back from this and it was a very intense two to three months for me. And unfortunately, I suffered from a, a stress fracture in my in my foot uh, which put me out for for uh, six months um this was not ideal after the start of that season um you know just put a real spanner in the works um so i was also coming off contract at the end of that year so um unfortunately it was um i came back for one game but it was very difficult for her in vain to to keep me on um, because it was a risk for them, you know, and they hadn't seen me how I recovered from this injury yet. Um, so I spent that whole off season just training one-on-one -on -one with um, one of my old coaches from Heron Bay. So I was still, I was still living in Heron Bay with my, my family at that point. And um, it was just every day with him on the pitch, just recovering from that injury. You know, I just came back on the pitch and then the season ended. So it was tough to find it to find a, a new team at that moment. Um, you know, lots of lots of teams are seeing all the good stuff I've done before, but how has he recovered from this injury? Right? It's I had no platform to answer any of those questions at that time. Um, so my agent in Australia, he works very closely with um, these two guys in in Germany, and. Um, they're based in Stuttgart and they got me a trial, the Stuttgart second team. They said, hey, come over here for three days. They um, they want to have a look at you. I said, okay, I'm I'm on my I'm on the plane. I'm over there, you know, from, from the Netherlands over to Stuttgart. And it was three days. That's all it was was meant to be. Um, just there training, giving it my all um, with their second team. And then they say, hey, can you stay for, for two more two more days? We play a friendly game on Friday. I say, yeah, for, of course I can stay. Um, so on Friday, I have an opportunity to, you know, to show myself in a game. We played against uh, Greuther Furt. They 
uh, in the second league now. They just got relegated, I think, the year before in the Germany from the from the Germany first league. Um, in this game, I come on and score two goals to put us up three two, and it was from that moment that I had an offer from Stuttgart and go to Firth. You know, it was just just like that. Um, and it was like, okay, wow, you know. And then many people then was like, okay, he's he's back, you know. And then I don't know how Wolfsburg jumped in on that either. Um, so I, <laughs> but it was a very, very difficult decision then. Um obviously you had I was gonna join the second team of all three of them. Um but I think it was it was hard in that moment to say no to to Wolfsburg. You know, they're a very big club. Um and the assistant coach there was Dutch. And he was uh, actually friends with uh, Graham Arnold back in the day. They used to play together. And after I talked to him, I just loved his approach to football. And I think that was the moment where I was like, okay, I think Wolfsburg is the place to be. And you had some pretty good scoring at Wolfsburg. I know we were talking about Holland, your goal scoring, but Wolfsburg, you scored at one point 10 goals in 13 games. Unfortunately, you did get injured after that, which we'll touch on in a moment. But when you first were getting into this setup with this side and you started scoring goals for fun, what do you think it was about this whole setup that got the best out of you? I know a lot of people have said Germany is a real technical focused league. Do you think it was that? Do you think it was the culture or was it something else completely? Yeah, I think I think the first weeks it was just like I was so excited being back on the pitch, you know. I was with the team, we was consistent trainings, we were playing friendly games. And I remember um, the first game of the season I come on, it was 1-1 and I scored. I'm like, if, even for myself, like I dribbled and I, and I had this shot and it went in. I was like, well, that was a nice goal. Uh, anyways, we, we won that game 2-1. I remember the coach after saying in like an interview, it's like, yeah, we knew the quality of John, but we were um, something like we were not expecting him to be ready yet like he's still coming back from his injury or something like this and um then the next game I started and scored again and it was just from that moment it was just like on a roll I was on fire really and I just was just loving it and I think the the style of play the style of play that we had at Wolfsburg just suited me we played with uh, wide wing backs that put many crosses in and we played with uh two strikers so constantly one can come come into the ball and one can go deep and I think that's that suits me to a T. Um, and it was just, first of all, our team playing like that helped me so much because we had really quality team. And some of them are now in the Bundesliga. Some of them are in other first leagues um, in Europe. So um, it's definitely helped being in that environment because once again, I, I, I took this step when I'm not one of the best players in the team. But... I can score goals and I did that as best as I could, you know, and that's was my role in the team. Um, and then as you get, uh, you know, further into the season, it um, you you kind of see the difference in, in the trainings and, and the, the gym programs as well. You know, you now have um, a strength coach specifically for your team. Where in the Netherlands, in second teams and the 19s, we didn't really have someone specifically for us. It was like every now and then someone from the first team will help out, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, it was having that specific training program as well it was a huge step forward as well to to be a part of that. Well, unfortunately, after this, you know, amazing run of goals and forms, you did you did have an injury. And then on top of that, there was a global pandemic. So you missed a lot of football. <laughs> what was it like for you, you know, a young Aussie living abroad in a strange country, you just come off the back of this injury. Now we have this pandemic, a lot of time alone, a lot of isolation. What was that like for you and how difficult was that mentally to sort of get over this big hurdle? Yeah, so that was a very, very tough time. Um, I had just recovered from my initial injury. For It was out for six months and I had such a great start to the season at Wolfsburg. And it was really, really out of nowhere. I was just clearing a ball from a corner 
and some guy put his foot there and I've just, you know, just hit, hit his studs. Um, and then I went away with the national team. It was my first time back. It was with the, um, the under 20s. I think it was under 20s. Yeah, or um, under 23s. It was before the camp, before they um, had to play the Asian championships to make the Olympics. Um, and just my foot wasn't getting any better. And unfortunately, it was very unlucky that I, it refractured the same bone. And then, as you said, the pandemic came. Um, the only one positive thing about being injured in that time was we could train one-on-one -on -one in the gym. So the whole other team, the rest of the team, couldn't come anywhere near the training grounds. But because I was injured, I was allowed to go to the gym on my own. No one else could go to any gyms. But I was allowed in there. That was that kept me sane. <laughs> that if I was if if I had to sit at home as well, I think that would be um, even more mind numbing. Um, so I had had that that I was lucky that I could go in there and train, come back from my injury. But it was then eleven months between my my two two games because um, of because of Corona, um, and then we came back for like six games. Um, and because we were a second team and we played in the fourth league at that time, um, in Germany, only the, the top three leagues continued playing and we stopped again in the fourth league. Um, and that was the six months leading up to the Olympics. We had no com competitive games. Um, so that was also very tough because to be part of the Olympic squad was one of my goals when I was injured. You know, that was something that really pushed me to get through that tough time was I'm training right now because I want to be ready for the Olympics, you know? And it was still tough for me, but I had this goal to go to the Olympics, right? It was one and a half years um, ahead. And um, I knew that all the effort I put in now will help me to make it to the Olympic team, you know? That's a, a huge, huge goal of mine. Um, so using that uh, using that that period of time um, to my advantage was um, very important mentally as well as physically. Um, Graham Arnold, he when he was announcing the squad, he said that he wanted an experienced um, striker in the in the squad, and that's totally understandable. You know, he bring in Mitchell Duke uh, to do what he did, you know, for to help the team. But I just it was hard for me because I really wanted to be there. But I hadn't played a competitive game for like five months. Um, so it's totally understandable that you're going to look at players, especially playing in the A-League, that are playing every week leading up to it. You know, it's a no-brainer for the coach to, to, take some, to, take, to take someone like that, you know. So that was tough. Um, but there's another Olympics in what is it, two years from now, so <laughs> why not be ready for that? <laughs> so after that big layoff between competitive matches, when you finally got the chance to play another competitive professional match again, what was that moment like and how do you think you went during that game with so long off? Uh, um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't a long time, but we played every now and then some, some sort of friendly game. So, um, of course, friendly and a competitive game are very different. Um, the energy levels are very different most of the time. Um, but it was um, after I had moved uh, then to, to SC Paderborn in the second Bundesliga, where I finally played a game again. And I had played played friendlies leading up to that in preseason. And, um, you know, it was just like a, an awesome experience to, to be back on the pitch for a competitive game. Um, you know, just that adrenaline rushes through you have fans again as well um that was that was incredible because i'd only played really at second teams with, with many fans um so that was also a great experience but it was nothing i had never done before but it was definitely an exciting moment and during your time at paderborn you went on loan to your club where you actually are now vihen Wiesbaden. hope i pronounced that okay but what was that like when you first got told you're going out on loan? What was it like going in the dressing room with these players who, you know, know that you're not part of the full-time setup? The coach knows you're only there for a short period of time. What was that whole experience like? 
Yeah. Um, so I, I was on a two year contract at Paderborn and I hadn't really um, got many minutes in the first few games of the season. And we, we agreed together that um, it would be much more beneficial for me to go somewhere and play and come back for the next year. Um, and I was, it was also a reason because of no competition games for a long time, you know, that kind of stuck around for a little bit too long that I, you know, didn't really like that, but it is what it is. You can't really change things like that. Um, but uh, loans, loans can be interesting experience. As you said, it's like you're going somewhere and you're there to help. Um, you're there to play yourself. So you're there to help them. You're there to help yourself, but you're not really, they don't get anything from you really in the end. Um, so it's a little bit different from a player of their own. Um, um, it's not an experience that I would probably want to do again. Um, you know, I was there on loan last year, but this year I'm I'm here as a, a player from Van Wiesbaden, right? Um, it's a very different feeling. You know, you're the same club, but it's you feel different. Um, and it's 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 much nicer to be a part of a team than to be someone that every now and then it comes across in your head thinking, uh, but am I part of the squad really? You know, like this. Uh, yeah, but um, it was a season uh, that I wanted to use to get more minutes. I would have liked to get more minutes, but um, it is what it is. And now this year we are pushing for promotion, and I'm very happy to play my role and. Um, I know that I'll be needed in the next few months, um, you know, and if we want to get promoted. Everybody's going to be needed. Unfortunately, in Australia, the third division of German football, even the second division, is quite hard to watch. So a lot of people watching this might not have seen a lot of action of you, a lot of footage of you. So how would you describe yourself as a footballer to those people? What type of football can we expect to see from you if we see you in the national team again? I'm a number nine. Um, I have a uh, very good speed. I like to make deep runs often. Um, come into the ball sometimes, but I am dangerous in behind. Uh, that's that's my quality, and I have a very good instinct in the box. Um, I always find myself in a good position um, for crosses and for second balls as well. So, yeah, that's the type of number nine that I am. And you've been playing quite regular in German football now for a number of years, whether or not it's a youth team or the senior teams. How do you think German football is compared to Australian football? I mentioned earlier it has this bit of a reputation for being this tough technical league. Do you think that reputation's fair? Yeah, um, no, I, I think so. Um, it's hard for me right now to to compare to the A-League, for example. I was quite young when I played in Australia. Um, and I I didn't actually play in the A League yet before when I left. Um, um, but sp sp especially in the the third league here in Germany, it's very physical, um, and a lot of fighting. Um, it's uh, when you go second league and first league. Um, for example, when when you lose the ball, the other team will keep the ball. Like they will do everything to keep that ball. Like, but in the third league, it's like you can lose the ball, but then. You lose the other team, then loses it again. Like, and it's just like a fight backwards and forwards. You know, it's like it's um, only a few teams in our league take control of the ball, and we like to be one of those as well. But even the way we play, sometimes um, the ball is going backwards and forwards, and it's just a fight. You know, um, but you have then some teams that just want to stay in the league, and they are just hitting the ball long every time. That's quite difficult to play against because we like to keep the ball on the ground, but, you know, everyone's different. So, And you mentioned before, you know, you had all these goals set up around the Tokyo Olympics and this and that. But for 2023, what are your goals? What are you hoping to achieve for the rest of the year? So first of all, I want to get promoted with uh, Wiesbaden um, for myself and for the team to, to get promoted and go up to the second league will be a huge benefit. Um, a lot of eyes on all of us, um, which is also very important. And I feel I feel like when I make that move into the to the second league with this team, then 
maybe it brings uh, it opens some doors for the national team. Um, I'm ready to start getting back involved, but I know that I can't join youth teams anymore, right? So it's just a first team or nothing. So I have to be I have to be ready and have to be um, playing regularly and at a high high league to to do that. And so we want to get promoted. Um, the rest of the season, I want to I want to score maybe six more goals, and I think I can do that. Um, and that'll definitely help the team get promoted as well. So um, for the rest of the season as well, just just to play, play regularly, just to relax a little bit, enjoy it. Um, you know, it starts to get a little bit, a little bit tense. Um, you know, but um, I'm loving it, and I just want to to continue playing. Well, hopefully we see you around that national team set up sooner rather than later. But thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much for having me and, and providing me with a platform to to share some stories that maybe I haven't shared before. So thank you for that.